So we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to be talking about the Iliad in relation to ancient Troy, or more properly, ancient Troy in relation to the Iliad and other aspects that includes uh, archaeology, and, uh, primary sources, and oh yeah, we're going to do something different. Um, what's happening here is that we, we read the Iliad and uh, we are told that this is uh, a, a, a wonderful, uh, fictitious, mythological uh, epic and, you know, there's lots of great reasons for it and so forth. But uh, when it comes to its historical background, there's nothing to it. So it's questionable at best, uh, maybe just a little bit here and there, and there is no other version of the Iliad. Well, guess what? <laughs> there is, there happens to be uh, another version. It's not like nobody is around at that time writing things down. We have sources. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to tell you a story that the Iliad covers somewhat from a historical perspective. How's that sound? And you'll realize that many of the ideas in the Iliad actually did happen. How exciting is that, right? You know, uh, and uh, how we're going to do this, because it is a story that, it, that kind of balances between history and mythology. It, it kind of hangs there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this down and jump right into it. Uh, so first of all, we're going to be taking a look uh, at the Mycenaeans. Because the Mycenaeans uh, are the Greeks that are represented in the Iliad. They are the Mycenaeans. We'll go through that evidence, no worries. Number two, uh, we are going to look at, I'm so happy about this, Hittite records. The Hittites left records of what happened during this period of time. And it's far more complicated story than you would ever imagine. So we're going to get the Hittite version of that story. Number, number three, we're going to examine uh, Troy itself and look at the archaeological evidence. I told you this is going to be fun. This will be really fun. <laughs> look at the archaeological evidence and see where what we know about the Mycenaeans uh, coincide with the Hittites through the material culture. And of course, uh, finally, we're gonna be looking at it uh, from the perspective of the Iliad uh, and perspectives related to the Dark Ages, uh, the Greek Dark Age, so to speak. Well, in order for me to do that, I can't make the assumption that uh, the Iliad is fresh in our minds. <laughs> uh, in ancient times, uh, people would literally memorize the entire Iliad. In fact, in a place uh, in Asia Minor, uh, they would have a festival called the Pinonian Festival, where they had a competition. And that competition was people uh, reciting the Iliad from memory. And whoever did the best job the most exciting presentation, they would win a prize at the Pannonian Festival. Isn't that great? And they did this all by memory. Uh, people memorized the Iliad. Uh, it was, you'll see that in various classical writings, right? In Greek and yes, even in Latin, right? You're going to have quotations uh, from the Iliad in order to give an idea some more gravitas. You know, it's like, hey, this is a great, courageous idea. Let's quote the Iliad. This is something that has to do with ethics. Hey, let's quote the Iliad. You know, they, they use this quite a bit. And so uh, many of these uh, phrases became proverbial. 
But I still have to make an assumption here that you probably have not memorized the Iliad. Anybody here memorize the Iliad? No, no, no. Okay, okay. So I'm going to have to go over the story briefly. Is that okay? It's like a little summary uh, before we jump into this, right? But before I do, let's talk about uh, these the Dark Age, right? This dark period of time. Okay, so you have the period of time, this is brief, we'll go back to this, of the Mycenaeans. And during the time of the Mycenaeans, this is when uh, the story of the Iliad took place. That is historical truth. Oh, 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 we got something. It did happen, right? But not quite how you want it to happen. It's far more complicated. More complicated than the Iliad? I know. It is. It's a it's a labyrinth. Okay. Okay, so after the the fall uh, of, of Troy um, and the, the Mycenaeans, and you have this group, we'll talk more about it later, called the Sea People. Uh, the Sea People are uh, destroying so much. This is the fall of the of the Bronze Age. And now suddenly, as all these cities are devastated, um, and you have all these natural disasters, and of course you have these pirate mercenaries destroying everything in sight. Um, the Greeks are reduced to illiteracy. You know, it's a dark age. People are living in hovels and small villages, and and uh, and so the Mycenaeans, while they had great linear B. Uh, well, um, the problem is the Greeks now have nothing but what they say. And so the memories of this glorious Mycenaean age, and even earlier Minoan period, uh, are recollected uh, in through these traveling, well, bards. <laughs> these bards would sing various tales of, of great monsters, right? Epic heroes, faithful heroines, and they entertained so many. Titillating, right? Exciting. Didn't have TV or, or our modern entertainment system. What they had were stories, so people would gather together. And they'd listen uh, to these bards who would sing their various tales or say their various tales through memory. And so they composed what were known as rhapsodies. Okay, rhapsodies. You guys ever heard of Bohemian Rhapsody uh, from the Queen? And you notice that it changes all the time, right? You know, it's like, one point they're singing, you know, fast tempo, next second slow, and it's like these abrupt changes, right? Those, you know, rhapsodies. Well, these uh, these bards are these are, they are rhapsodists, and that means they are stitchers of songs, stitchers of songs. So they're literally stitching these various stories together. From what? Well, from memory, but from other stories. And so so this is how you, they do things together. So they'll tell a story, and then, you know, they'll hear another good yarn, and they go, you know what? I'm going to add that story onto this story. <laughs> of course, what's going to happen uh, is, is that the stories sometimes don't go very far. <laughs> you know, So they tell a story about the hero, and then they go, Oh, by the way, let's talk about this hero. He was born. And you're like, okay, now we're going to follow this hero, this whole background. And then they catch up and they go, oh, look, this is like a silver goblet. Let's talk about the silver goblet. And then they stitch in another song about us. You know, are you following me? This is what they do. And so um, one of the masters of the stitching of songs is he is known as, well, they call him Homer. Now, I went to the classics department at UCI. I was I was there, you know, and um, you know I sat there in various symposiums. Homer is dead, right? You know, Homer doesn't exist. Homer is mythological. Who's Homer? 
you know, <laughs> other than Homer Simpson, right? Uh, and, and so, so you would say that Homer is strictly, uh, he is mythological. You know, of course, people like Herodotus would indicate that Homer lived about 400 years before his lifetime. So around the 850s, you know, and, you know, and then, of course, you have others that say that he lived in the 700s BCE. Okay, so the so so it's kind of funny because the majority, not all, the majority of those in ancient times believe that Homer uh, is, um, well, uh, he really did exist; that he was one of the greatest. So modern uh, literary theory takes a look at this. They go, no, no, no. no. Uh, you see, we take a look at the Iliad, and the styles keep changing, and so it, there has to be multiple Homer. The style changes here, the style changes there. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I was, again, in the classics department. We went over the text <laughs> of the Iliad. We went through that. Yes, yes. And there changes the style. Yeah, but you know what happens? He's stitching songs together. <laughs> and sometimes he took them hook, line, and sinker for himself. Now, there's no copyright laws in those days, right? You know, uh, if you take a look uh, at ancient writers, Plagiarism is everywhere. <laughs> They're quoting each other constantly. There's no way to filter this out. But what Homer would do is he covered over all these various stories with his own special gloss. Got it? There's a gloss that connects it the way he puts things together. So you, so you look for the Homeric gloss. But it does change. It does become abruptly. It does. Um, and so, you know, we went in our classes, we identified the areas like, oh, this changed. <laughs> the story was pl placed there. You know, it's like, oh, it's now time to uh, talk about the shield of Achilles. <laughs> and I talk about his armor. Well, this is going to go forever, right? Right. So so there you have it. Um, yeah, you, somebody says you still can't copyright a plot, right? Yeah, good point. So this story is, it's free for everybody else. And you know what? There, we know from the scholars of the Library of Alexandria and others that there were other versions of the story. They were just weren't as great. <laughs> Homer's was the best version. But I got to tell you, all those stories surrounding Troy were still floating out there. It's that, that, that uh, Homer was considered such a master that he supplanted the others. We do have other versions that have survived fragments quoted by poets here and there. Is this exciting? You guys learning things already? Yeah. Okay. Fun stuff. So, yes, I, I attended those symposiums and got into the arguments. And, you know, but it's, much of this is modern reconstructionism and literary theory pressed upon an ancient context that does not know about not copying or taking from others because everything is within the public domain. Is that working, right? But of course, that public domain happens to be the dark ages. So nobody's writing things down, <laughs> right? It's memorized. Only later on does it get written down. And of course, the story goes is that Homer is, is blind. The blind poet, was he blind? I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know. You know, he may have been, he may not have been. We do know that uh, there happens to be quite a few people who are blind and in the, in the bar position. There's, there's a few boring reasons for that, you know, it's called um, trying to make a living, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, you know, if you're blind, it's, it's difficult to do agricultural work. It's difficult to be a soldier, right? You know, it's, but you could be a bard. Remember, it's memorized, right? So just something to think about. As we move through this, right, there are, there are reasons why these stereotypes happen, but is he blind? I don't know. Okay, so, well, we covered all that. <laughs> I looked at my notes, I'm going, um, although my notes are pretty interesting, uh, I'll just tell you ahead of time, just like uh, many ancient texts, my notes have gaps. Uh, what happened is my uh, <laughs> my printer didn't work today, and I couldn't get a new ink. So I literally uh, have have these wonderful gaps that uh, make life beautiful. So exciting stuff. So I'll have to 
fill in, you know, you don't have to kind of fill in those gaps. <laughs> okay, so moving right along. So, okay, so what is the story? What is this epic story of the Trojan War? What is it about? I mean, we, yeah, right? uh, well, the Trojan War, uh, it is a war against, well, <laughs> Troy <laughs> by the Mycenaeans, right? Uh, and um, against the Trojans who actually have uh, an ethnic name. We now know what they are called. What? Yeah. They're called Luvians, although I'm going to spell it this way. L-U-W-I-A-N-S. They are 100% Luvians. That's a big aha moment for scholarship. Okay, so we're learning new things right away. Yeah, so it is the Achaean, you know, Greeks, you know, the Greeks, the Mycenaean Greeks versus uh, the Luvians of Troy. Got it? Okay, so now... Um, what happens is, um, according to the story, we're going to go into what most likely happened in history, but according to the story, um, well, you know, I had to tell you something about the Iliad. <laughs> it doesn't cover much. <laughs> it's a 10-year war. Yeah. And um, uh, the Iliad covers like the, the you know few months of the, the last year. <laughs> it doesn't even get to the end. <laughs> You, there's no ending, you know, it's, just, it's like, it's kind of leaves you hanging. So you're thinking, Dr. Reedfeld, that's, that's not, I mean, how do we get this whole story of Troy, uh, this great 10-year battle, when we just have, uh, you know, just this little bit? I mean, is it all about digressions going back, you know? Oh, before this hero, this happened earlier that year, or two years, or 10 years, or whatever. There's some of that. But you may not know, or you may know. Uh, is that there was other oral traditions that covered the entire 10 years. Yeah. And that somebody decided to put together their version of it that became the, the version of it just as much as the Iliad or the Odyssey with Homer. Uh, it's known as the Cypria. S, sorry, sorry, C Y uh, P R I A, Cypria. Yeah, the Cypria. This talks about the causes of the Trojan War. This, this talked about everything up to the moment the Iliad takes place. Isn't that great? Somebody thought about doing that. Now, this is part of the oral tradition, the Cypria. However, it was finally composed from the oral tradition after the Iliad, they would say between 625 to 600 BCE. Finally gets written down. Who's, who says that this is that epic? Well, actually, uh, of ancient writers, lots of them. <laughs> ancient testimonial, right? What's interesting about this is that most of it is lost. Unfortunately, uh, if, in fact, we we'll, we only have 50 lines that have survived. Uh, even even still, poets uh, quoted ideas or portions of it and say, well, Cyprius says this, Cyprius says that. And from that, we can cobble together the contents of Cypria. One part is obviously the famous story of the judgment of Paris. That's a, I love that story. It's a very interesting story. The Judgment of Paris. Um, so once upon a time, uh, there is, well, I guess we're telling stories now, right? <laughs> there's, there's a marriage that's going to be taking place uh, between the goddess Thetis and the mortal uh, Peleus. So, um, and it's going to be taking place uh, up in Olympia. So it's it's kind of a big deal. This is this is kind of an event where everybody needs to show up. Anybody who's anybody 
all the gods, all the goddesses. This is this is the, where you're to be seen, and you know, and show off, right? Uh, it, well, okay. So everybody's invited. For some strange reason, the invitation for one of the goddesses got lost. <laughs> I don't know why Eris, the um, goddess of discord and chaos, I don't know why she wasn't invited to the, the, the wedding. I mean, you know, what fun could be had with her there, right? You know, nothing like a little strife. Well, she wasn't invited. She was insulted because everybody else was there. So she took it as a slight against her. She took an apple, a golden apple, uh, from the Garden of Hesperides, uh, and she had inscribed on it uh, the word Kalistay, which means for the fairest. <laughs> and then what she did is she took this apple and she threw it through in some versions of the story through the gate, you know, uh, at Olympus, and it rolled uh, during the ceremony. There was this, there was this apple to the fairest. Well, guess what's going to happen? Well, uh, immediately, you know, Hera, the wife of Zeus, picks this up and goes, the fairest. Well, that's me, obviously. The wife of Zeus. Well, Athena, goddess of wisdom, says, no, 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 Ferris, that's, that's, that's me. I'm the Ferris. Aphrodite says, you, you guys are kidding me? Look at me. Okay, I, I, I'm the Ferris. This is my golden apple. So Hera says, dear husband, Zeus, go ahead, go ahead and tell them, you know, Ferris. Of course, she's just like, um, you know, um, I know, I know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy that could do the judging. He, he's he's great. I mean, he really is great. Um, one time, uh, he was judging between a bull, my bull, and another bull that was actually Aries in disguise, uh, which was the best, and he chose Aries, the bull Aries, and so he's great. His name is. Paris. <laughs> Paris, one of the many, 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 many sons of King Priam of Troy. <laughs> Fifty sons. That's a lot of sons. That's maybe too many, what do you think? So, so, so that's what happens is, is the goddesses go, all right, so they go up to, 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 to Paris and they ask him, who is the fairest one of all? You know, I would never want to be in this kind of position. I mean, you know, choosing between three goddesses and you're going to insult at least two of them. Is this something that you really want? I don't think so. Um, Paris is kind of, you know, he's, he's, they say he's intelligent, um, but um, I don't know. Probably should refer to, should have been like Zeus. You know, I know a guy. <laughs> but uh, then the other problem is, is that each of them, this is this is cultural. Each of them privately offered Paris uh, a um, an inducement to, to maybe use them. Right. So what happens, as you can imagine, is that Hera um, uh, says, "Oh, I'm going to make you great king. Would you like that? If you choose me." Athena says. I'll make you a great warrior. And Aphrodite says, I am going to give you the most beautiful woman in the entire world. She also sweetened the deal. Uh, she put on a special charm around her. She kind of cheated through magical enchantments, uh, uh, through the charities and the horai, so that when she moved around, flowers sprouted out and music <laughs> was through the air. It's just like, 
it's a, it's a goddess perfume, you know. And uh, he's hooked, right? He's he says, Aphrodite, you are the beautiful, the most beautiful of all. And of course, gives a gold apple to Aphrodite, and angers um, Hera and Athena. So this is not going to go very well. So you can understand that Aphrodite will always be on the side of Troy. Uh, do you think Hera is going to be on the side of Troy? No. <laughs> She'll be on the side of the Greeks. And Athena will wibble, wobble back and forth, but usually she's on the side of the Greeks, especially after they defy her temple. That's another story. Uh, is this good? You guys okay? Right? So here's one, there's one little, little, little problem with this. The most beautiful woman in the entire world happens to be married. It's Helen, Helen, the, the wife of King Menelaus, who I have to say, he's not a really great character. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to say too much about him, but uh, he, I just have to say he's just not the ideal husband. But what about her? Um, you know, well, Helen. She was very young. Um, oh, I, I wish I wasn't talking to a modern audience. A little way, way too young. Um, I'll just give you a source here. Um, Hellenius uh, of, of Lesbos in the fifth century it says that she was seven. Um, uh, Diodora says that she was 10. Fortunately, Stastascarus, thank you, Stastascarus, say that three times fast. <laughs> Says that no, she's of childbearing years. <laughs> childbearing years. Uh, that means like eleven or twelve. Okay, maybe not so great. So a uh, pretty, uh, pretty young, you know, very young, uh, according to Darius Figulus. I told you I'm using primary sources here. Uh, she was very beautiful. Uh, she had a, a, a unusually beautiful mouth that just opened up like a like a flower. I'm just giving you the example, sorry. Um, uh, she uh, was brunette. Most of the accounts said she had brown hair. Uh, the Iliad says that she was white-armed, long-robed, and richly tressed. So, you know, long hair. Um, and it also mentions that, uh, um, this is Phrygius mentions this, that she had a beauty mark between her eyebrows. I don't know. Okay, so there he goes. <laughs> <laughs> give me too much information. I don't know. <laughs> so you can probably spot her out in the crowd now. There, there she is. There's Helen. Okay. So, so, uh, so Paris now arrives uh, at the throne room of Menelaus as a special embassy uh, from the city of Troy. You know, this is not going to go very well. And uh, Paris, what he does, oh, Paris the self-centered, they call him the unmanly one, uh, goes ahead, uh, they call him unmanly because he prefers to make love rather than war. I'm, I'm not joking about that. They make fun of him because he wants to be making love to Helen as opposed to going out there and fighting. I'm thinking, you know, I'm with Paris in that one. Anyway, moving right along, but uh, they don't think that's unmanly. Whatever. So what happens is that uh, Paris, he does abduct uh kidnap, maybe it is literally kidnap, but anyway, we'll go there, uh, 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 Helen, right, from, from King Menelaus, gets away with it. Uh, something you may not know, I don't think Helen really liked Menelaus that much, did not protest too much, and there are several legends of where they spent their honeymoon uh, in a place where near where the Pharaoh's lighthouse island uh, used, you know, was was stood. So that in Alexandria, yeah, but they hung out there for a little while, for a week or two. I know you're going. Wait a minute, that's kind of weird. I know she didn't seem too upset. If you read the the Iliad, she doesn't seem too upset. Doesn't doesn't seem like she really wants to go home all that much. <laughs> anyway, well, that's a whole other story. <laughs> okay, but uh, reading between the lines. So eventually they go back to Troy. And Menelaus is angry. He's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call my uh, my 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 brother. Uh, he of Mycenae. His name, of course, is King Agamemnon. 
King Agamemnon. Uh, sorry. Um, Agamemnon is, is, is not exactly my favorite character either. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you, know, I mean you know, he does, unfortunately, uh, for example, on his way uh, to uh, together this, this, this group to take over at Troy, excuse me, uh, he does kill one of uh, the stags of Artemis, and then he thinks that Artemis wants his uh, uh, daughter, Epigenia, to be Epigenia, excuse me, that's not working, to be sacrificed uh, to Artemis. There are stories where Artemis takes her away at the last moment, or she's killed. Human sacrifice, I don't know, I'm not really with that. Um, so, but that's what happens. And of course, you know, when you, when you kill your daughter in cold blood like that, uh, somebody's going to be angry about that. And of course, namely the wife, right? <laughs> you know, uh, so she's, she's not happy about it. Um, that's uh, Clytemestra, right? She's not too happy about it. Of course, when he returns, uh, she murders him uh, along with Agastus, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, so what happens <laughs> is, is uh, um, they all get together, all the Greeks are getting together, and they are going to cross over to Troy. They're going to attack Troy and to get Helen back. That is the goal. That is the wish. That's the ideal. I want you to have in your mind this idea that the Mycenaeans uh, in Greece are going to cross over to what is now Turkey, Asia Minor, in this expedition, and they're going to attack Troy for 10 years because that's not true historically. Huh? Yeah, we're going to, this is interesting. So you have a simple idea of going from Greece to Asia Minor. We'll realize the history is far more complicated. And of course, it's kind of this once only kind of thing. You know, we're attacking Troy at this moment in time. And at this moment only, follow me, if you will. Okay, so what happens is that they cross over. Uh, and uh, we have um, the war is about to begin. And the war goes on for, for 10 years. You know, and so um, long enough short of it is, is that uh, uh, we have to get to the beginning of the Iliad, right? Okay, how, how does the Iliad begin? It begins as follows. Uh, you're going to have a situation uh, whereby Agamemnon uh, has angered uh, the, um, the, the, the Trojans, uh, but especially because he took uh, the, uh, the, the high priest of, of the Trojans took his daughter away and made her into a, well, a, a, a concubine, which is, is not a good thing to do. Uh, this is, of course, the Trojan priest of Apollo. Uh, his, not to be too confusing, his name is Chrysus. Her name is Chryseus. So, uh, Chryseus uh, is taken captive, and King Agamemnon has her as his own. And the, the king pronounces that there is going to be a plague because you took my daughter away. And there is a plague. Um, and so Achilles and the others try to convince Agamemnon, you got to give him his daughter back. You just got to do it. And Achilles probably was a little bit too pushy about it. You really need Agamemnon to return that girl. And so he does. The plague ends. But... Achilles had his own concubine, his own woman, uh, and um, well, Agamemnon says, I'm going to take um, your concubine away from you then to compensate for my loss, because after all, it's good to be king. <laughs> okay, well, that's not good, you know, and so, so the slave girl, Breezes, is taken away, uh, who he captured in battle. Achilles uh, is a very interesting character, right? Uh, uh, he is, again, uh, you know, his, his mom is, is Thetis, 
uh, and um, and she is a Nerid. Uh, she is a sea nymph, right? Uh, it's interesting because we have uh, her name literally means to establish, and according to the, the poet Upton, uh, she was uh, considered at an earlier time a goddess who created the universe. So she has uh, been demoted quite a bit uh, to a Nerid. So uh, there you have it. And of course, his father was Peleus, king of Pythia. Uh, he was invincible, uh, except for his heel. The story goes is that uh, mom, Thetis, uh, dipped him in the river Styx, made him invulnerable, except for that old heel. And uh, in, the, in the end, that's how Achilles gets killed, supposedly. But this is not mentioned in the Iliad, but supposedly um, an arrow shot by Paris pierces his heel, and that's the end of Achilles. Take a look at his name. Uh, it's Proto-Indo-European, uh, and it means sharp foot or pointed foot. <laughs> so it's the agony of defeat all over the place. <laughs> he is defeated. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to hold you by your heels in this one. Oh, stop. All right. So what happens now is that he's going to pout, right? Uh, Achilles is not going to, I'm not going to fight because you took my slave girl away from me. All right. So, uh, and now uh, since Achilles was one of the greatest warriors of all, this is probably not a good situation. And so then the book kind of goes on. In fact, you know, at one point, Achilles actually asks his mom, Thetis, to make them lose, make the Greeks lose. What a nice guy, you know, because I want them to appreciate me, 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 me. All right. Okay, so what happens, uh, there's lots of lists now, you know, they list all the, all the Greeks who are fighting in battle, they list all the Trojans. I told you, I'm giving you a refresher. <laughs> that list goes on uh, kind of forever. Eventually, they call a truce, and Menelaus will fight Paris. That kind of makes sense, right? I mean, Paris is the is the offending party. Okay, well, there's there's no hope for Paris. So at the last minute, before Paris is going to go the way of the River Styx, <laughs> he is whisked away by the goddess Aphrodite. Well, that's not fair. And then uh, Hera well, was not, not pleased by this and convinced the Trojan uh, warrior by the name of Pandorus, uh, interesting name, Pandorus, okay, anyway, uh, to shoot an arrow uh, at the, the Greeks and that starts the fighting all over again. Then, of course, you have the great warrior, Diomedes, uh, and um, he enters into the fray and he uh, fights against uh, Aeneas. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, Aeneas doesn't have a chance, but Aphrodite jumps in and saves Aeneas <laughs> from Diomedes. <laughs> Aeneas will go on uh, and found the, the, the rudiments of the Roman people. <laughs> and that, of course, is a famous epic uh, poem the Romans consider part three, uh, Iliad, the Odyssey, and the, and the Aeneid. Uh, and, a, and he is related to Romulus and Remus of uh, the lineage there, and of course the foundation of Rome. So uh, obviously Aeneas's mama is uh, Aphrodite, known as Venus by the Romans. Okay. So then you have Ajax and other warriors, and yeah, lots of goobly gop, just lots of war stuff going on there. <laughs> um, and of course Zeus says it's forbidden, you know, no, no goddess or god can interfere. Uh, and then you're going to have a situation where um, um, uh, you know, it looks like the Trojans are going to win. And then what happens is that is Hel sorry, sorry, Hera convinces Zeus to kind of, you know, in a lovemaking kind of wonderful moment, he becomes distracted. And during the distraction, uh, she makes sure that the uh, uh, the Greeks will lose. Uh, Sorry, so the Greeks will win, excuse me, and the Trojans will lose. And then, of course, he, he realizes what happens. No, no, you're, you're using me. Yes, Hera, she is using you all the time. Okay, but you use her. So, hey, 
it works. It's equal uh, situation there. Finally, we're at the end. Uh, so what happens is is that Patroclus says, "Okay, you know, um, if I want to fight," and Achilles says, "I don't want to." Okay, well, then what are we going to do? Achilles says, "I'll let you borrow my armor." And then people will think that you are you, you are me, sorry. And people think that you are me. And because people will think that you are me wearing my armor, you'll have an advantage. And Patroclus says, that's a great idea. No, it's not. It's not a great idea. But anyway, so in his hubris, uh, Achilles gives him uh, the armor and Patroclus goes out. And, um, and he's, he, he, the Greeks are winning. And all of a sudden, Patroclus was feeling this, this, you know, the, the blood is the blood is boiling. The, the, you know, the fury of the battle has, has caught him. He, he's a little intoxicated by it, and he should retreat, but he keeps on going, and he finds himself chasing after Hector, and that's not a good idea because you know Hector is the is the brave, strong, steadfast older brother of Paris. Uh, who didn't want to have this war in the first place, but he'll do it because it's the right thing to do. He's all about duty. I mean, he's a great character. And Hector's like, <laughs> so Hector, of course, uh, kills Patroclus. Um, Achilles is pretty upset because the two were extremely close. Uh, how close were they? Well, you know, he was older than Achilles, by the way. Uh, they had a very close relationship. Uh, many will say it was a romantic relationship between the two. Who says so? Well, you have Ascanus says so. Uh, he lived from 389 to 314. Uh, he understands it as a romantic relationship. He says it's pretty obvious. It is, is manifest to such of his hearers as are educated men, he says. Plato assumes the same idea. Uh, in the symposium, Patroclus and Achilles are viewed as the model for romantic love. Uh, Alexander the Great uh, sees himself uh, as Achilles in connection to his lover and his partner, Hephaestion. So there you have it. So yeah, uh, I have. there's lots of information that shows that um, Achilles lost his, one of his loves. So, so he's pretty upset. He's anger, angry. So he goes and attacks Hector. And he kills Hector, stabs him in the neck. And then he proceeds to drag Hector's body around around the walls of Troy. It's pretty, pretty, pretty upsetting stuff. What follows after that uh, is the uh, uh, is that Patroclus' ghost appears be be before uh, before uh, Achilles and says, "I want to be buried." They call up the battle uh, for a temporary amount of time, and then following that, uh, they have, have mourning, they have also festivities, and amongst all this, uh, King Priam shows up. The gods protect him shows up amongst the Greeks and says, you know what, can you please uh, bury my uh, my dear son Hector, or allow me to bury him to take his body? And he, he said, okay, all right, and Achilles weeps, and okay, so there, and that's the end of the Iliad, that's it, <laughs> we did it, we got through, Dr. Reedfeld, Trojan horse, not in there, Trojan horse, I want to hear about the Trojan horse, not in there, it's not in there. Um, that's uh, that's mentioned in a few sources. Uh, the the it's it's alluded to in the in the Odyssey. The Aeneid by Virgil mentions it. Uh, Quintus Smyrnus uh, mentions it. Um, you know the wooden horse uh, was built in three days. They leave the horse as a gift for the Trojans, although the inscription uh, showed that it was dedicated supposedly to Athena for safe return home, because after all they destroyed her temple uh, when they're in Troy. Uh, 30 hidden the horse. Some cases it's 23, 40, 150. Uh, what is the, the Tro Trojan horse? Some people say that it was a battering ram and they just got the story mixed up. Uh, other people say that, hey, maybe it was uh, it was a gift ship. So, you know, just don't look at a, a gift horse in the mouth anymore, right? You know, be, be, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Okay, so much for all these stories. Now we move into, we finished it. Where do we go from here? Let's talk about the mice and ants. The mice and ants. Well, um, I got to tell you, uh, the mice and ants, uh, earlier, ancient Greece, 
uh, was during the, the early Hellenic period. Uh, 2750, 2000 BCE was occupied by a non-Indo-European people. They dominated Greece. Well, around 2000 BCE, Indo-Europeans arrived into Greece. This is the middle Hellenic period, around 2000 to 1550 BCE. These Indo-Europeans are ruthless. Uh, they burn down villages or other villages are abandoned. As we can see within the material culture, uh, in some cases they acclimate. But in, many, in most cases, not so. They are pretty powerful. Uh, and these Mycenaeans, they settle in the jagged region of, of the Greek uh, landscape. And because of the hills and valleys, they're very isolationist. They're very independent. right? And, and um, they grow their grapes and their olives and those along the coast, they fish. By the late Hellenic period, 1550 to 1150 BCE, the Mycenaeans developed into an urban culture, and they continued to be pretty aggressive. Uh, their leaders were known as the Wanex. So each a Wanex is back, basically a warlord. Uh, they had attached to them uh, their, their their military. They lived on the top, oftentimes on the top of these hills that were heavily fortified, their palace was there, and oftentimes the temple was there. So the highest point is where they lived. Everybody else is further down, you know, that's just the way things are. So that they basically settled upon what's called an Acropolis, right? Yeah, so the early Acropoli uh, were oftentimes a place where mice and hens would situate uh, their, their palace as well as the temple, keeps it safe from the surrounding area. Everybody else lives further down, heavily stratified society, uh, which is the opposite of the Minoans across the way, right? The Minoan civilization, unfortunately, falls. The Minoans, I wish that would be a whole other talk. The, there was a gigantic uh, explosion of the island of Thera, and this advanced, a very advanced civilization collapsed. And in that vacuum around the Aegean, the Mycenaeans filled it up. They filled up that vacuum. Uh, the Minoans uh, before them, uh, you know, we take a look, except for the last two centuries, the Minoans who thrived between 3,000 to 1,450. Uh, the Minoans, uh, we look at their, their, their cities and there's no walls around it, showing they don't need fortifications until the latter period. Uh, we take a look at, at the houses and the houses have uh, four to six rooms all the way across the board. Uh, we even do soundings and we realize, wow, so that there's more of an even distribution of wealth. Uh, the Minoans were more centrally uh, uh, organized, like almost like a, a bureaucratic monarchy. Uh, they focused upon trade and commerce uh, and Sifron, you know, and uh, they, uh, women and men had some of the same positions, although women dominated the area of religion. Uh, women wore these beautiful outfits. Uh, they wore these kind of these balloon pants. <laughs> uh, and they had these elaborate hairdos. And of course, uh, the men and women were, were typically topless. But the men, men, and men were typically topless as well. See, it's all equal. Uh, the men usually used to wear kilts. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, they were known uh, to be advanced when it comes to forging gold, uh, as well as other metal alloys. Uh, they worship basically goddesses. They loved sports. They were our, our, one of our first leisure uh, societies. They had enough free time on their hands to pursue other fun things. Uh, as I mentioned, sports, bull jumping was apparently fun. Uh, various ball games and um, yeah, and, and wrestling and men and women both participated in this. So really advanced civilization on so many different levels. In some cases, they had running water. It depends on where. And now it all falls. And in this vacuum comes the warlords, the Mycenaeans with their Wanex, right? <laughs> oh, what a disappointment. At first, there's a compromise, but then things kind of went down from there. Linear A, which is the writing of the Minoans, we can't decipher. Actually, we can decipher part of it. We can talk about that afterwards. I'll tell you how. 
just a little bit, not all of it, because of the Luvian loan words. But we can um, we can read Mycenaean uh, writing that's Linear B. And this is where we get part of our story put together. So Linear B. Um, linear B writing reveals so much about the, the Mycenaeans. And these, of course, are the people who attack Troy. So we're learning now from uh, uh, sources from that time, right? We know, of course, that they're notorious pirates. We realize that the religion was polytheistic. Uh, they worshiped uh, various Indo-European gods. Uh, they're patriarchal. Um, it turns out that they worshiped an, an all-high sky god deri that derived by the, from the name Dias Pitter. Dias Pitter. Dias Pitter, of course, uh, this is the great Indo-European sky god uh, from, and of course, Dias means sky, Pitter means father, you know, Pitter, Pater, Vater, father, right? You know, these roots. Uh, Dias, of course, we get the word sky or day, Dias, day, right? <laughs> um, so you have, and of course, eventually, uh, Dias Pitter, right? Uh, you'll have the highest one known as Dias or Zdias or Zdus, and that becomes obviously Zeus. Then, of course, you have this Zeus Pitter, Zeus Pitter, and then, of course, it travels over towards Illyrium and then it goes from there to the Romans, and Zeus Pitter becomes Jupiter. Pretty fun. So, the, you have, but anyway, they worship this all high god who ends up actually becoming known as Zeus. And we see this within the material culture. Uh, lots of these uh, Minoan, sorry, Mycenaean uh, places. Um, uh, we have lots of tablets, uh, Kenosis and Apelos. At Kenosis, I want to talk about this real quick. We find that Zeus uh, is referred to as Zeus the Chaos. According to the sources, Poseidon, also his name is referenced at Knossos. Uh, we know that they, they, they would sacrifice an, an ox, a pig, and a sheep uh, to the god of the sea, although uh, he's a god of the sea in transition. He was once uh, the earth shaker, the underworld, as well as the earth god that eventually becomes a sea god. So we'll go to my Poseidon talk next time, and we'll go into those details. Ares is mentioned, uh, Potinea is mentioned, who is simply the mistress. Uh, uh, you're going to have the mistress even of Athens that is mentioned, Elathea. even have a Potinea uh, of the labyrinth. Yeah, using the word labyrinth. Meanwhile, at Pelos, the Linear B documents, we have over 1,000 tablets. 1,000 tablets. Again, Zeus is important. Uh, as deity, you have Zeus as a male deity. You also have Zeus as a female goddess. What? He has two aspects, known as the Wea, which is the female personification of Zeus with its own special um, sanctuary. You have Hermes is also mentioned here and Dionysus. It looks like the majority of the gods that are brought about in the Iliad the Mycenaeans had them. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Also, at Pylos, we have a Poseidon that is worshipped uh, as well. In fact, we know the offerings to Poseidon. It's listed, first of all, to Poseidon. They would offer wheat, wine, and then one bowl, ten cheeses, one ram's fleece, and honey. Another list will mention wheat, wine, two rams, five cheeses, oil, and one ram's fleece. Another one will, will list corn, wine, and two rams. A fourth will mention corn, wine, five cheeses, and honey. Why is that important? Because in the Iliad, as well as in um, classic Greece, the offerings are the same order. Yeah, the same order. In classical Greece, you offer the grain offerings first, whether it be wheat or corn. Second, you have the libations, right? The wine, right? 
Third, animal sacrifice. Isn't this fascinating? And then, of course, the bloodless sacrifice could be ram sweets or some kind of object. So a lot of ideas that are in the Iliad and in Greek religion later on are already established from the Linear B tablets uh, that we have documented by the Mycenaeans. So already parts of the Iliad are coming true. So it's fascinating. It gets better, right? Poseidon, by the way, has a female aspect too, uh, Epilos. Uh, in fact, that's known as Akina. Uh, which uh, had 45 slaves that were dedicated to this female personification of Poseidon. It works. And of course, Artemis is also mentioned of Pelos as well. Okay, well, here we go. We're moving on. So now we go to the mainland. We talked about the Mycenaeans. Let's talk about the Luvians, the Trojans. Here we go. Well, we have what's called the Demersi Huya culture, a thrive between 3,500 to 2,500 BCE. Uh, they're basically the first footprint of the Indo Europeans as they arrive in Anatolia. Uh, they, they fight that is on a plateau uh, west of Eskinzi here, right? So, this is an early Bronze Age site, a zigzag defense wall. A double room trapezoid, long houses, and so forth. And this group moves south as well as west. One group, of course, becomes the Hittites, who occupy the, um, the plateau region in the middle of Anatolia. But the other group are the Luvians, who occupy all along the coastline of, of, uh, of Asia Minor, right, of, of, of Turkey today. Uh, that when they arrive at along the area around Troy, they're known as the Yorton culture. And uh, we find their typical pit graves. It's interesting, they, they bury people in their pottery and jars and infants in smaller jars. We can, we can also recognize their movement through what's called red slip pottery around 2350 BCE. And we know that the Luvians are there to take advantage of the rich mineral deposits, the various metals. Uh, and they, they are the ones who arrive and are uh, in Troy, and it's called Troy II. And Troy II, 2600, 2250 BCE, the Indo European Luvians arrive in Troy. The Luvians now view Troy as their homeland. Luvians view Troy as their homeland. Who says so? They do. <laughs> so we have something called the Festival of Istanua uh, that happened in a place they call Sun City in Southern Anatolia. And they have what is called the Thunder Songs. One of the songs sang out, Aha, Atata, Alati, Ayanta, Walusati. <laughs> when they came from High Walusa. And Walusa is a name for Troy. Yes, I do. The language. <laughs> uh, there you have it. In fact, uh, uh, the name, Priam. Uh, is a is a Luvian compound word, uh, pri umua, which means exceedingly courageous, <laughs> exceedingly courageous one. So here we have already. This is kind of a big deal, right? So we now have a direct connection here. According to Hittite records, the uh, Trojans became associated with what is called the Asua League. A S S U W A, the Asua League. There were 22 members of the Asua League, 22 members. And this is a Luvian League of cities, or actually some cities and territories. So it includes like the Luca, the Warisa, the Parisa, 
the Welusia, the Karaicha, which of course are the Carians. Now what's interesting about the word Asua, because what will happen is we take a look at this word and yes, we can derive this word has uh, lots of ramifications, but um, uh, it is the word that we get to, uh, Asia from. You guys ever heard of Asia, right? Asia Minor, and then it becomes Asia Minor. That is come from the word Asuwa, right? So what will happen is, is that um, the Minoans, the Minoans, then your then your A, wait, Dr. Richfield, what are you doing? The Minoans called this area Asuya. I'm using I know in here. And then the Mycenaeans would call this region in Mycenae. They call it Asiwuyo. In Pilos, they call it Asiwia. And at Kenosis, they call it Asiyatia. <laughs> and that all means, of course, uh, Asua, the Asua League. So, so now. Uh, Troy is part of this league, uh, this, this confederacy uh, that's united. And at first they interacted between the Minoans on one side and the, uh, the uh, uh, Hittites on the other. And then later on, they'll be interacting with the Mycenaeans on one side and the Hittites on the other. So there you have it, the Asua uh, League, right? Now, what about the city named Troy? I say Melusia. Well, how is that the word for Troy? I'm gonna, okay, so here it is. In Greek, they at first, they earlier on had a W, a W sound known as a digamma, W. And it looks like an F in the, the shape. So it's Wa. And so the city of Troy was called Walusa. Walusa. Wa. Okay. In fact, we know that when when Homer or anyone, right, was composing, putting together the Iliad, that it still had a in it. Because uh, it turns out when the W is removed, the poetry is off because it's lost its consonants. Wow, yeah, it was a W, Walusa. So what happens, it drops and it becomes, as opposed to Walusa, it becomes Elusa. And this is where we get the word Iliad. Iliad is the name of the city. Ilium, it's the, you know, does that make sense? So it's Walusa, then Ilusa, and then, of course, um, Ilium, and then, of course, the Iliad. Well, what about the name uh, Troy? Where does that come from? <laughs> well, Troy, uh, the surrounding area that, that uh, Walusa controlled was a place known as Tarusa. Tarusa, the surrounding area. Eventually, it becomes known as the Troad, and then of course it becomes Troy. So the city of Troy, it's, it's actually the city of, of, of Walusa and its territory around it uh, is, is Troy. <laughs> so it's kind of like getting, it's, it's kind of like getting things mixed up today. It's kind of like calling um calling our uh you know calling our country Washington <laughs> uh, and and um the capital is known as America or the United States. <laughs> See how that works? You guys got it? Yeah, I know. These things get messed up. All right. So where do we go from here? Well, the Asuma League uh, is defeated by the Hittites. Defeated by the Hittites by King Tulahia II, 1450 to 1420 BCE. He defeats this league. And so uh, as a result of that, uh, the Hittites uh, start to dominate, uh, and um, and and um, in fact, uh, Tudahila says that he brought back ten thousand captive Asuan soldiers to his capital of Hattusas, along with six hundred teams of horses, 
oxen and sheep. Uh, he also uh, brought, brought back with him many of the spoils from Asua, uh, including the former king, Ayama Kao, and his son, Kukuli, right? Uh, and uh, so there you have that. Well, then later on, uh, uh, what will happen is that King uh, Tulahia II also brings back a bowl that happens to have a Mycenaean warrior on it with a plumed and horned helmet. And we take a look at the sources from that time, and we realize that during his reign, 1450 to 1420, he has a relationship with the Mycenaeans. Wait, 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 what? Wait, these are the 1400s. The fall of Troy is the 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11 85. What do you, well, this is a little early. You know, the Mycenaeans are already causing problems in uh, Asia Minor. It's, it's already now in those Asia. Already? Yes. What are they called? They're called, the Mycenaeans are called the Ahiyawa. Ahiyawa. Uh, the Ahiyawa, there are 25 Hittite texts that refer to the Ahiyawa, which of course will become the word Ahian, as in the Ahian Greeks later on. And, um, and we, we have the sources for the Mycenaeans extend all the way to Tulahia IV, uh, whose reign ended in 1209 BCE. So we have records of the Mycenaeans from the Hittites. This is very exciting. Well, uh, at the time that the Asua League fell in 1430, the Ahiyawa, the Mycenaeans, were located mainly in Greece. They weren't, they didn't cross the way as of yet. But, uh, in fact, a damaged letter uh, from the time of Tutahia II mentions the fact that the king of the Ahiyawa, they were in, he was in possession of various islands, most likely the Aegean islands. Uh, now, uh, Tulahia also indicated in his writings that this Asua League was being supported militarily by the Mycenaeans, that they were supporting it with weapons and other things. So that's why he didn't like the Mycenaeans, you can imagine. So they already have a great vested interest in the area, right? Now, there is a story where it, during his reign, it refers to a campaign on the Siha River land where he says that the king of Ahi Ahiyawa withdrew or retreated and took refuge uh, with the king um, of the Ahiyawa. So you have mentions of that, right? But they also mention a certain king of the Ahiyawa that they mention is called Maduwata. <laughs> I don't know these names. Maduwata. Maduwata is mentioned as a king. Later on, Maduwata is known as a state. So the king's name gives name to a state. Maduwata uh, happens to be the city of Miletus on the Ionian coast. And now we have, during the, the time of King Arnuwanda, 1419 to 1418, kind of a long time, short time, I mean, we have already evidence that the Mycenaeans, they're not off in Greece anymore. They are in uh, Asia Minor. They're already there. They're already at Miletus. They're already occupying that place, right? So what happens after that uh, is, of course, what are the Trojans going to do? Troy, you know, the, the Melusa. They're not going to be a part of any more leagues for the most part. They're going to stay independent uh, at this point. And there will rise up another state. The, the new state will take the place, will take the place of the Asua League. And this is a, this is a um, I know it's all new history, isn't it? I, <laughs> it's another state that's known as Arzawa. <laughs> Arzawa, which is another Luvian. Uh, uh, state, and the capital of Arzawa is Apassas, which is, of course, the city of Ephesus, located on the Castros River. Uh, Arzawa had a earlier history 
uh, with um, Hittites. It existed earlier, around 1700 BCE. Uh, it traded with both the Minoans and Mycenaeans. They are Lubians. Um, there was a raid by Atusali, the first in 1650, uh, where he attacked this area. Uh, then uh, King Labarnas of the Hittites, 1600 to 1586, conquered Arzawa, made into a vassal. But by 1500 BCE, Arzawa was independent again. And Arzawa will now rise up and form the Arzawa League. Uh, along the Ionian coast, filling in that vacuum. And of course, who's going to support them? The Mycenaeans. There's the Mycenaeans. So they're propping open, uh, propping up the Lu this Luvian state, right? Arzawa had a nice relationship uh, with the Egyptians. In fact, the ruler of Arzawa named Arhurandru uh, corresponded with the pharaoh Amenhotep III. As we discover from the Armana letters, they wrote back and forth, uh, even to the point uh, where there was a um, a situation where um, uh, oh, 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 um, Aho, oh, excuse me, uh, they, they decide to kind of uh, seal the relationship with a royal wear, uh, wedding. Excuse me. So, so the Arzawa League is is now it's now formed. Uh, it's powerful. Let's keep going. So, okay, so moving right along. Well, now, uh, during this period of time, you're going to have the Hittite king. Here we go. This is the big moment. I know we may go a little over, not too much, but we'll go a little over because it's too good. It's going to get really good now. Now's the moment you've been waiting for. <laughs> uh, Hittite king, Sapo Luma. You kind of love the names. I, I, I love the names of these Hittite kings. It's fun to read. Sapo Luma, 1344 to 1322 BCE. 1344 to 1322. He was able to push back the Arzawa alliance. And he created a close friendship with the king of Troy. The name of the king of Troy was Kuko Uni. Kuko Uni. And so now the Trojans have an alliance with the Hittites, which means that the Trojans turned against the Mycenaeans, the Greeks, at this time. We have a historical document <laughs> that says, hey, Trojans have gone anti-Greek. You guys got it? And now I can give you an exact time during the reign uh, between 1344 and 1322. Uh, you have this break, and Kukuuni, a K U K K U N N I, just as I said it, uh, uh, he will now uh, ally himself with the Hittites. Well, the next king, Musili of the Hittites, the second, he did make a temporary peace with the Mycenaeans because they're now causing problems. They're starting to invade Asia Minor. We already. Wait, this is the 1300s. Why are we supposed to wait to the 1200s or the late 1100s? They're already yeah, they're invading. You see, it's a different story. Different when you, they're, they're, they're migrating. They're entering in. They're causing problems. So he's trying to keep make, make some peace. Musili II. He even permitted the uh, Mycenaeans, the royal family of the Ahiyawa, to come to the Hittite capital, Hattusas, to study the art of chariot making. <laughs> this is how you make chariots. At one point, the Musili the, the second of the Hittites was sick, and a statue of the Ahiyawa god was brought to heal him. So the Mycenaean god was brought there. Uh, the peace did not last long. Uh, soon they're back to war again. And so uh, against Arzawa, and against Arzawa and their Mycenaean allies, who are who are centered in, the Mycenaeans are centered at Miletus, which still exists today. And the um, center of Arzawa is Ephesus, Apassas. So there you have it. Well, the Hittites attack Apassas, the Arzawa League. Um, and uh, 
the story goes is that Musili II marched toward Ephesus, Apostles, a meteorite hit the city and injured the king, Ahu Zita, who then agreed to an alliance with the Ahiyawa or the Mycenaeans against the Hittites. But ultimately, the Hittites are victorious against Arzawa. Uh, and the story goes is that the defeated king of uh, 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 the defeated king of Arzawa heads quote back, back across the sea to the islands, according to Hittite records. So uh, the Arzawa king he flees and joins the Mycenaeans. So we are learning that they're the Mycenaeans attack and then they retreat, they attack and retreat but they're holding on to the area of Miletus. Then what happens is after Arzawa is defeated, the Hittites break them up into these little kingdoms, uh, at loud client kingdoms. Meanwhile, we have more about Troy, but we'll get there. According to a letter dated to 1295 uh, to the king Musili II, a client king by the name of Manapa Parhuta uh, um, there is a story that there is an attack upon the city of Troy. You mean you have, an, you have an exact date? Yes. In 1295, Troy was attacked by a marauder. And his name was Payama Radu. Payama Radu. And he attacked specifically the city of Walusa. So now we have a date, 1295. He is a Luvian. Right, and um, uh, his name means gift or uh, gift devotee, right? And um, of course, who is this Payama Radu? Well, he does. A lot of people say that he is the son of the king of Arzawa, who went back with the Mycenaeans. Most people say that he was the son of the son uh, of, of the king of Arzawa, but he still had uh, credibility. And he will cause problems for the Hittites, the Luvians, and the Trojans for the next 30 years, <laughs> going back and forth and attacking constantly and oftentimes around the city of Troy. So uh, what happens is Payama Radu uh, was able to assert himself and gain an alliance with the Mycenaeans specifically called the great king of Ahiwa, according to Hittite records, sealed this deal, Payama Radi, gave his daughter's hand in marriage to Atta, the vassal ruler of Miletus of the Mycenaeans, and so you have now an alliance. Then, in the late 1300s, uh, also uh, 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 BCE, Sapaluma I uh, cultivated, as I mentioned, the friendship with Kukununi, the king of Troy. But by 1280, 1280, the grandson of Sepaluni I, King Mawatali I, the second, excuse me, uh, desired, desired to maintain a friendly precedent with the current king of Troy. That king's name, okay, so this king's name, around 1280, his name is Alexandrus. Alexandrus, Dr. Rietveld, that's a Greek name. I know. It's Alexander. Alexandrus. And they had a peace treaty. So the Hittites have a treaty uh, with the, the king that follows uh, uh, after, uh, after the uh, uh, Kukuluni, right? It was Alexandrus, right? And we take a look at this name. And we realize that there's a lot more going on here. The letter um, um, goes in, it's, it, it suggests that uh, Alexandrus may not have gained his position via royal succession, but came from elsewhere, and so was not related to the previous king, Kukuuni, by blood. And most Hittite uh, scholars agree with this interpretation. It is important for you to realize that according to the Iliad, right, there was a Greek by the name of Alexander who was king of Troy, Alessandros of Ilium, 
whose nickname was Paris. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have to pause on this one. Nickname is Paris. And so it's most likely that uh, uh, the son of King Priam of Troy was named after this King Alexander. So there is definite proof. Oh, it gets better. Uh, this, this treaty, this agreement with Alexandus, right, was done in the name of the god Apollonius. Apollonius? Yes, according to Hittite records. Apollo. <laughs> Apollo's name appears in Hittite records uh, as a main god of the city of Troy. Under a king, Alexander. All right. And um, um, he is declared as a the, the, the divine warrior of the Trojans, according to this uh, this uh, uh, this treaty. It's interesting because, um, according to the Greeks, um, yeah, Apollo was viewed as a great warrior as well. Right. So you have this. Then what happens? They also invoke a goddess in the treaty by the name of Kak Alkur who is the goddess of the local springs. Uh, the, the Hittites mentioned that there are underground passageways and tunnels uh, in Troy or Walusa, and it turns out they discovered these, these tunnels. They exist. They're there. And so we have actually found these springs. Wow. That's a lot of information. Uh, who is uh, the next king of Troy? Oh, his name is Walmu. <laughs> what a great name, Walmu. <laughs> So we know the names of the kings of Troy, at least three of them, right? Now, according uh, to the Kawagawa letter, uh, Hattusla III, uh, 1267 to 1237 BCE, the Mycenaean, Mycenaean king um, uh, mentions Payama Radu, that same marauder, is still around and causing problems. Lots of problems. So... Uh, what happens is the king of the Mycenaeans uh, tried to guarantee that he would have safe conduct. Uh, he also refers to the, his, uh, the brother of the king of Ahayuawa, which uh, is another Greek name, uh, which is um, uh, Etowakalis or Etowakalis, right? So uh, what happens from there uh, is that... Um, I know we're losing time here, but you see Paya, uh, uh, Paya Maradu continues to cause problems. Uh, Hattusili III mentions the fact that the Hittites and the Ayawa, or Mycenaeans, once fought over Troy, Walusa, but now they were at peace. This is around 1240. So now there's a reference here that the uh, Mycenaeans and the Hittites, they already fought over Troy <laughs> before 1240. Right? Okay. We're not done yet. What happens following uh, Wamu <laughs> uh, is that the Hittites put various pretenders on the throne after that. Uh, one of those pretenders fled uh, to another kingdom, uh, and the Hittites uh, took him back, and they're going to send an envoy to replace him back on the throne. So you do have uh, lots of chaos going on here. And now, I'll wrap it up in the next six minutes. So what does this tell us, right? This tells us quite a bit. We take a look at the archaeological records, right? And we realize there are correspondences everywhere, right? You realize that when you tell the story of ancient Troy, right, what they, can, they put into one big episode that lasts for 10 years, this conflict between the Greeks and the Luvian uh, Trojans, it turns out that it is reducing about a century and a half of actual conflict. Got it? A century and a half of actual conflict. So we're not looking at one war, we're looking at at least six or seven conflicts going back and forth. And the Mycenaeans, they're not over in Greece. <laughs> they're, they're already uh, in uh, Asia Minor. They're already established at Miletus. 
uh, and they use that as a beachhead uh, to expand and fight against the Hittites with the Luvians caught in between. But everybody wants to have Troy, and Troy then becomes independent because it is considered strategic, right? Why is it strategic? Well, Troy guards the Dardanelles. It's this strait that connects the Aegean and there, of course, obviously the Mediterranean with the Black Sea. But the problem is the currents, and oftentimes the weather, uh, uh, forces uh, the, uh, the currents to go southward. So, you know, if you're rowing, your arms are going to get pretty, pretty weak after a while, and you're going to have to stop. Where do you stop? Troy is positioned right along the Dardanelles at that time. at the perfect position to stop and rest your arms. You know, sails don't oftentimes work very well. And they had a little harbor that's secured and you rest, but you got to pay. You got to pay. You know, you got to. Uh, and yeah, so you have that situation, right? Well, I, I don't have time to talk about this, but I'll mention this, is that the Mycenaeans wanted this. How do we know that they wanted it? They, they traded with Troy. How do we know that? Because we got their pottery. <laughs> their pottery ware is at Troy. But you know what happens? Towards the, uh, the, the, we get towards the end of the 1300s, the mice and man wear disappears. It becomes 1% of the pottery at Troy when we get into the middle to the end of the 1200s. They're not trading with those mice and man's anymore. They're not trading with the Greeks. What does that tell you? Yeah, it tells me that the mice and man's are being cut out. <laughs> right? Do you think the mice and ants are going to be happy about that? Right? Meanwhile, we look at the pottery and they're trading with the Hittites and they're, the Trojans, they're trading with the Peleluvians. That's going all well, but not the mice and ants. So there you have it. Also, I want to mention a few more things just about the city of Troy itself. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this uh, is that um, we take a look uh, at, at the city of Troy. Troy was a great city. Uh, Troy, uh, number 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 six, uh, was was thriving. Uh, there's they kind of split it between Troy six and Troy six B. Troy six uh, is 1700 to 1400 BCE, and then Troy six um, H, or oh, sorry, yeah H and H goes from 1400 to 1250. 1250. I want you to remember that number, 1250. During that time, uh, Troy was great. It was amazing. You know, the first half, they were part of the Azua League. The second half, uh, they were independent, right? They had this great citadel, uh, and they had the rest of Troy was below the citadel. It covered 62 acres. It had 10,000 people. Uh, you know, in fact, the lower part was surrounded also by a very strong wall, uh, and it had tall towers as well. In fact, the Troy that, that is destroyed by 1250 fits the description of the Troy mentioned in the Iliad. It has the same kind of walls. It has the same kind of buttresses. It has the same kind of towers but it's destroyed in 1250. What happens? It's destroyed by an earthquake. An earthquake destroys it. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> of course, they have the stories of the earth shaker Poseidon, you know, building the walls of Troy, right? <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah, but there was, and we find archeological evidence all over that there was an earthquake. What happens, what, what about Troy, Troy 7? It's a nothing. What? Troy 7 is, is, is nothing at all. You know, it's, they, they, it was heavily fortified. Sure, uh, they fortified the top citadel. It did still have nine meter high towers. That's pretty good, you know. But it was, it was far smaller. It, much of it was shrunken back into just the citadel proper. And much of it was abandoned. So, not a great city to conquer. 
<laughs> Maybe the Macedonians attacked because it was weak after 1250. You know, it's vulnerable. <laughs> Maybe the Macedonians are thinking, yeah, but we're going to pretend it's the good old days when we attacked earlier and were defeated <laughs> by the Hittites. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so, and maybe that's what they're doing. Uh, Troy 7 is divided into Troy um, 7A, Troy 7B1, and Troy 7B2. I would just say that Troy 7A is the late 13th century, so basically the 1200s, the late 1200s. Troy 7B1 uh, is, is the 1100s. And Troy 7B2 is the, is the 1000s. We do find, here you go, drum roll please, that Troy 7A from the 1200s was destroyed by war. We find heaps of sling stones. We see also evidence of significant uh, carnage, skeletons, yeah, human bones. They, in fact, we find it lame unburied these bones inside the south gate uh, in two of the houses. So they're, they're being slaughtered, right? And the evidence of the destruction also shows there is a burn level. Eight corresponds to around 1190, which is the traditional date that we uh, uh, connect to the fall of Troy. And uh, and who destroyed it? Indications are that it happened to be the Sea People. <laughs> who are the Sea People? A mixture of groups, including Luvians, but also including uh, defective Mycenaeans, <laughs> who, by the way, attacked their own people too. At Pelos. <laughs> Is this making sense? So. Mice and ants were involved along with others. And this is the fall of the Great Bronze Age. And so the city falls during this time. It's rebuilt, but it gets smaller and smaller as time goes on. I have just put together one of the most complicated stories. <laughs> you thought uh, that uh, it was difficult for, for Homer to stitch together <laughs> the Iliad. Can you imagine? trying to stitch this speech together, especially since the printing didn't work. <laughs> so <laughs> every page, missing sections. <laughs> I feel like a warrior myself <laughs> getting through that. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's every lecturer's nightmare. <laughs> it's like, oh no, <laughs> it didn't print off. Oh no, can't get any, no time. But I've made the time, and I think I filled in all those gaps that seem to be missing when it comes to the historical record uh, behind the Iliad and the ancient city of Troy, and you will not look at this history the same again. Thank you. All right. Did you guys like that? Very much, yes. A lot of details in there. <laughs> uh, but, you know, as you always say, the mice and ants are in the details. Oh, wait, no, no, that's not what they say. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think they say something else. But um, you realize what a complicated story this is, though. Uh, so I, I think that uh, the Greeks wanted to make something simple and binary, kind of the us and them, you know? You know, heroic Greeks versus Trojans. I think they probably didn't want to add in heroic Greeks, Trojans, uh, miscellaneous Luvians, and Hittites. <laughs> and, oh yeah, uh, and Payuradu. Uh, this, this, is, this guy that is, is, is like an is like, like independent uh, kind of marauder that's doing his own thing. By the way, um, uh, the Hittite uh, king also tries to make him a vassal. So and there's a point where he all makes offerings, say, want you be my vassal? And uh, the Mycenaeans are, want you be my vassal? Uh, some people uh, have even conjectured that um, uh, uh, Paiu Radu is uh, King uh, Priam. 
So that's uh, that's one theory that's going out there among scholars. But but yes, it is a very complicated story, and the end obviously is the Sea Peoples. You know, everything comes to a, a screeching halt, and the Sea Peoples, as we know, uh, is uh, and I and I can tell you the story in a relaxed way because we don't have to worry about time, but. Uh, and that is the Luvians. I love them. Uh, unfortunately, they were treated like second-class citizens by the Hittites. Hittites dominated the, the plateau uh, of Anatolia. But the Luvians were related as Indo-Europeans uh, to the Hittites, occupied the western and the southern coast of, of Anatolia, and of course, their, their homeland was Walusa. We talked about them. And um, what happened uh, is that um, the, uh, the the Luvians started to gain more and more power. They started to become organized. And they're kind of like this wedge in between the Mycenaeans on one side and the Hittites on the other. And so they have to create various leagues in order to survive. So you have like the Asua League, right? And then, of course, the Arzawa League. Both, of course, are, are Luvian in nature, right? But uh, and sometimes they will side with the Hittites. Sometimes now they'll decide, they'll decide with the Mycenaeans. But the Mycenaeans, if you take a look, are slowly creeping and taking over the coastline of Asia Minor at Miletus and other places. They start creeping around. We find their pottery at Ephesus and other places, too. They even have a tomb in Ephesus and, uh, and other places besides that. And so the Mycenaeans are clearly migrating already at this time uh, into Asia Minor and making their, their, their presence known. And then the Luvians uh, start growing in population, as I said, and their urban sites are everywhere. You know how many Luvian cities they have discovered in Western Anatolia through satellite imaging that have not, for the most part, been excavated. I'll give you the number right now. 340 cities. 340. And now they're excavating them, Luvian cities. And you know what they're finding? It's so exciting. You can take a look online. They're finding written Luvian documents. Read. We have the whole history of the Luvians that are waiting for us. And these 340 cities, they found a whole bunch of materials just last year. <laughs> and the year before that, can't wait because that's going to be a whole new chapter uh, in history. Uh, so if you want to be a Luvian archaeologist, this is the time. The Luvians then start to become the majority population in the capital of the Hittite Empire, Kutusa, they're becoming a problem. Meanwhile, the Luvians are the ones who are dealing with all the rich metal ores. They're, they are, they are the metallurgy. That's what they're all about, you know? Interesting that there's so much in the, in the Iliad about armor and metal and so forth, right? But they're all about metallurgy. But the center of getting the ores is a city, sorry, is the island known as Cyprus. Island Cyprus is the center. <laughs> what happens, unfortunately, is that during the 1230s, the Hittites break across the southern coast, the Luvian coast, and they take Cyprus away from the Luvians. The Luvians are angry, and the Luvians seek to fight back. And the Luvians become, how do I say this? They start relating to one another, and and meanwhile, it's even more complicated. The Hittites have been fighting the Egyptians with Luvian mercenaries. Meanwhile, the Egyptians have been fighting the Hittites with Luvian mercenaries. Well, you have the Peace of Kadesh. As a result of the Peace of Kadesh, all these Luvian mercenaries are, are unemployed. <laughs> the peace has brought about, well, problems. What are, you know, all they know is killing and stealing and so forth. So these mercenaries then go back, right, to the coastline, uh, to their Luvian brothers, and they all get angry, and you can see what's going to happen, uh, is that they become organized, 
and they become known as the Sea People. These are the Sea People. Now, unfortunately, I told you that the Mycenaeans, they're kind of marauders too. They're kind of pirates. And so half of the Mycenaeans joined the Sea People. We know that from Egyptian records. We got Mycenaean names uh, connected to uh, the invasion of Egypt, which is, of course, what we know about, but it does really destroy the new kingdom uh, quite a bit to weaken in the last another century. So, so half the Mycenaeans, it's really sad because the Mycenaeans will attack other Mycenaeans. <laughs> and, and it's like the, the Mycenaeans, I mean, you know, looting, killing, pirates, you name it, they do all those things. It's terrible. Well, is, is there a representation of how we can understand them more? Yes, it's called the Iliad. <laughs> the Iliad are the Mycenaeans in every single way. It's their personality. So, so even though there's aspects that are from uh, the Iliad that connects to uh, the, dark, the Greek Dark Age, right? Uh, uh, we know that most likely the author of Homer is, is connected to maybe Smyrna because he knows the area pretty well geographically. But so much of it is recorded memories and ideas of a character of the people known as the Mycenaeans, and it carries through. So, so when you read the Iliad, it does capture so much truth, not just historical truth, but also the character of the people. Uh, but, and they, of course, all, are always fighting each other, right? The Mycenaeans are always fighting each other. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, part of them root, uh, joined the sea people, and they attacked the other Mycenaeans. <laughs> they attacked themselves. They're part of that group. And it is highly likely, because uh, we, you know, pottery, obviously, highly likely that they uh, joined the group of sea people that went up and says, you know what? It's time for us to gain the Dardanelles. <laughs> you know, we, we've been cut out of trade for a century, <laughs> as the pottery reveals, right? Uh, it's time for us to get back. And so around 1190, uh, they attacked and uh, demolished uh, this very weakened Troy, because remember, Troy was not as great as it was before 1250 and before 1250, before the earthquake. So they're really attacking something that's kind of vulnerable. I hate to say that. <laughs> I was going to say easy pickings because that fortress is still pretty strong. But the outlying city and you know, the population is a lot smaller. You I mean, you know, at its prime, Troy has been compared to by archaeologists as the comparative to Uberon. Which is kind of a big deal. So it was a it was a pivotal city before 1250, and it was independent. So as soon as the Asua League was over, and the Arzawa League came about, and they weren't part of that, Troy became a strong city that, uh, that everybody wanted, <laughs> and the Hittites wanted it, and the Mycenaeans wanted it, but the Mycenaeans couldn't get it. And then of course they had these independent kings. But it's interesting though, is these independent kings have Greek names. What is the explanation for that? <laughs> but the other part is this, is Greek kings also have Luvi and other names. So, so you have Alexander, but the word Paris is actually a Luvian name. So does that make sense? So you got Alexander, but uh, so they have both, you know, you know, are they, is there mixed blood? You know, are, you know, is there, you know, you know, what is that? Again, we also have the connection that they seem to be worshiping the, the, the same kinds of gods. Also, we know, as I said before, the, um, the Mycenaeans are worshiping the very same gods that are mentioned uh, in the Iliad. Probably in a different way, but at least we have the same names and aspects of the same characters. So we have that too. Whew. Anyway, that's my recap. <laughs> so, any questions? Is there an English translation available? Huh? Hello? Oh, sorry, my thing froze. Um, okay. it, is there an English translation of the Iliad that you think is more faithful to the Greek? Oh, I'm boring. You know, I, I you know, I mean, you know, the Penguin uh, Classic is okay. Pelican is okay. Uh, the lobe is needs to be updated. Um, you can read Greek, 
The penguin, the uh, penguin classics is good. It's a good one. That's a good one. I like that one. Uh, you know, there are versions. I hope they still have it. There are versions that have the it's like the it's like the lobe, but it's it's, it's better. Uh, where you have the the, the Greek uh, interlinear version, where you have the written text on one side, uh, and then you have the the Greek with it. I don't know. We, you know, they have various readers. I would say the best place to, to go is the class, sorry, is the bookstore at UCI. Uh, and they have uh, various versions of the Iliad. I recommend going there. Let's see what the latest is. I, 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 I use the Greek version. I'm not very helpful. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's interesting, though, how the Penguin Classic is good. Penguin's good. Oh, okay, it's good. Yeah, I guess if you go, go with P, it's all, it's all good. Right. <laughs> version is great, but it's very much a, a English poetry, not Greek. Yeah, it, that's the problem. Is is that the uh, it is it is poetry. Mm -hmm. It is, and um, you can never quite capture it uh, in English. It never will. You know, that's there's there's a meter. The meter does go a little off every time the word uh, ilium comes up because it is Walusa. So there is a, there is I, I guess that's a Continent problem. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, any other questions? I've got one. Yeah. So the the sea people, did they have any sort of like home base or political structure, or were they just kind of like roving seafaring band of a hodgepodge of different cultures? Basically, did they have they leadership are, or they are rambling hodgepodge different yeah. characters and. Um, and that, that will be the impression uh, of the Egyptians. That will be definitely the, the, the opinion of the Hittites as uh, they are being attacked and destroyed. They destroyed the Hittite empire by 1180. The Hittites uh, as an empire is over. Uh, the, the Luvians uh, with the others, um, other groups. I mean, we know that the sea people come from the southern coast of Anatolia as well as the western coast of Anatolia out and the Aegean Islands and Sicily, of all places, <laughs> and most likely Sardinia. <laughs> so they're everywhere, at least spread out. <laughs> yeah, and it seems to me to have that much, to cause that much damage or what have you, they'd need some sort of central power. It reminds me a little bit, I guess, of maybe like the Vikings. Yeah, yeah. But they, 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 once again, yeah, it is. It is just like the um, uh, Mycenaeans. They are under these warlords, uh, the, like the Wanix or the Mycenaeans. Well, and some of these uh, sea people are um, the uh, um, are uh, uh, you know Wanix or Mycenaeans, right? What I think is interesting is this. Good way to answer this question is. Take a look at the Iliad, right? Look at the Iliad, and you see how you have all these kings from all these minor places who are just basically warlords, you know, and uh, and and they have uh, loyalties that are extremely strong just to them. So when an Achilles didn't want to fight, you know what happened? None of his men fought either, you know. So you're going to have you have these close associations. So you have. All these groups, they will fight for themselves in league with other groups, but then soon after, just like we know about the Greeks, they start fighting afterwards. And this goes on even to the classical era of, of Greece and Spartans and the Athenians and so forth. Uh, this is, these are the, the Greeks for you, and uh, it's unfortunate. But uh, I will mention there's a few other reasons why the sea people have an advantage. Of course, surprise is one. <laughs> Another is is there were what, what happened to be a shift in the climate, so uh, and that was problematic. A shift in the climate. The other thing is is that uh, iron, which is cheap and easy to produce uh, during this time, uh, was um, was now being forged uh, in. Uh, Eastern Europe, and pretty soon 
it was the Luvians that used this iron to their advantage. Remember, uh, this is the Bronze Age, right? And, uh, and they were relying upon Cyprus, right, for their metals. And they were focused in on the bronze trade. Well, let's just say they got an iron constitution. <laughs> they traded metals. <laughs> and this made things uh, easy for them and cheaper for them uh, to produce these iron weapons. So uh, Luvians will switch over to iron, probably one of the earliest groups to do so. Well, it's the Mycenaeans, too, towards the end. Although the Mycenaeans... And that gave them a big advantage. It gave them a great, great advantage. Yeah. So, and then they, they figured out, uh, first in bronze and then iron, how to make scary helmets that look like something out of Lord of the Rings. You know, the kings with all those scary <laughs> spikes and everything else. <laughs> because yeah. their idea is to scare you as much as possible uh, just by their helmets. Yeah, it's intimidating. Intimidating. They, didn't, they did not really organize very well. They, the, the sea people, they destroyed the Mycenaeans, even though some of them are Mycenaeans. They destroyed the Hittite em Empire, they destroyed all the major kingdoms along the uh, Middle Eastern coast, right? They destroyed all of them. Uh, and, um, and, and who was organized? The only, only sea people that were organized were a group that settled along the southern coast of the Levant. And those are the Philistines. Philistines are the sea people. So that's the only one. Other than the Philistines, that's it. But also what they did is they wiped clear all these empires, weakened the Egyptian empire to the point where they didn't have an overseas empire anymore. You know, it was just, you know. And so they kind of cleaned the slate for the emergence of a new world. So out of this chaos in Mesopotamia, the group known as the Assyrians can rise up. Out of this, this chaos uh, of illiteracy and this, this dark age, uh, what will happen is those uh, known as the Habaru, or, or the you know, Israelites, right, are able to move into that vacuum and the Canaanites reasserting themselves in that mixture. Right, between the two. That's another complicated story, which is another bit for another time when it comes to archaeology. But uh, so you do have that. And, um, you know, so that, that's pretty much it. So, but uh, other places, they don't really produce much. Um, it's sad. Having said that, the Luvians continue their civilization along the coast. And that is, and they continue while, while, while linear B of the Mycenaeans end, Hittite language, you know, ends. Um, a lot of these languages are over. Literacy is everywhere. And people are moving up into the mountains. They don't want to live along the coast because they're going to be knocked off by these pirates. But the Luvians, the language continues. It continues uh, into the tens, into the nine hundreds, into the eight hundreds. The Luvian language continues. And the Luvians will break themselves into various groups. Look at the word, look at the word Luvia. You're going, wait a minute, Luvia sounds like Lydians. They're Luvians. Oh, Luvians sound like um, Lycians, the Lycians. They are Lycians. The Luvians sound like, you know, except for the L, sound like the Mysians. They are the Mysians. Um, what about the Carians? Those are Luvians too. So these are all Luvian groups. And so we're able to read their languages. And then those languages in turn, uh, uh, of course, go into the Greek period. So, yeah. Any other questions? I had one. Uh, you, you mentioned these 340 or 350 undiscovered Luvian <sighs> cities. Yeah, we, so, we know where they are. With, with all these buried texts out there, what do you think is, or for you, what is going to be the most exciting question that that's going to be able to answer once we get those and Ooh. start to have a chance to read them? Excellent question. What they're going to reveal is more 
because alluvians are active, we're going to learn more about the Mycenaeans. We're going to learn more about the Hittites. We will learn more about the Minoans through the, because they were right there um, trading with the Minoans. And this will fill in, and they're the closest to the Minoans, right? The Mycenaeans weren't, weren't, weren't trading that much, but the Luvians were. And remember, the Hittites are further over. We will learn about a new civilization uh, that had it was its own independent culture. We will learn about a new religion. Um, I have done a talk, uh, presented a talk on Luvian religion and Luvian rituals that have been revealed as a result of some of these texts. And it is completely different uh, from what we've experienced before. It's like a whole other new mythology, new gods, new goddesses, new religion, new way of seeing things. But it will, it will give us more information uh, on the Hittites, on the Minoans, on the Mycenaeans. Uh, we, in fact, I revealed that they even had relationships with the Egyptians. And so uh, we'll learn also about the key uh, to more about the Sea People. We will learn more about the mysteries of the Sea People because guess what? They are the Sea People. <laughs> they eventually become part of that. So we're going to learn more about uh, that within the context. Uh, we will learn further. We will, we will, we, uh, we're going to gain a, a, a lot of knowledge on the economics from that time. Because, you see, they didn't have money like us, right? You know, they didn't have currency, but they did have a, a bartering and trading society. And a lot of the documents are economic lists of various products. So we will be able to put together uh, the economic system of, of not just the Luvians, but through their connections of the entire Eastern Mediterranean world. Kind of a big deal. Yeah. Wow, so, exciting stuff then. Exciting, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I recommend uh, you go in online, even on YouTube. Uh, there are some Luvian studies, uh, videos that will go into detail. They'll have pictures of these Luvian sites. Um, uh, last, was last year or the year before, I posted on my Facebook, uh, they, they literally found one of these tablets laying in the water. <laughs> There's a picture of it. It's laying in the water. You can read the inscription in the water. <laughs> it's sitting there, you know? So, so uh, we're, we're going to have quite a few texts but that's going to take some time to translate. Um, I didn't mention the fact that, uh, let's, go, let's go to uh, another topic quickly. The Minoans. We cannot read all of Linear A. Well, that's not true. We can read parts of Linear A because they have Luvian loanwords. Right, so the the the, the Minoans traded Luvians enough that they started taking their words or their symbols along with them. Well, that went the other way. So it it is possible that with enough Luvian documents, we will be able to crack Linear A of the Minoans. Wow! So there is there wow. a potential undiscovered. Rosetta Stone out there, maybe? There already is uh, places where they'll have the Luvia word and the Minoan word right next to each other. Awesome. So we already have that. Yeah, that we already, we, we, that's why we're able to get like about 10% of, and we know that uh, they, the, the, it was the Minoans that gave us words like sandal. <laughs> and the Minoans also uh, gave us the word Asia. That's a Minoan word. And of course, you know, that's a, a big deal. Is that, is that interesting? Very much so. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. yeah it's, it, it, is a, it is a huge deal. Uh, Hunker Kessler and quite a few other archaeologists are in Turkey are working on this. But I really encourage others to either get involved or even be, 
uh, become a Luvian archaeologist. We need Luvian archaeologists uh, uh, more now than ever. There are too many sites to be excavated, not enough people, not enough money to, to excavate them or preserve them. And, uh, you know, I, we, you know, obviously times are tough here. It's the, we're living in the, in the uh, pandemic period, but uh, we're, we're emerging out of that. And I think that's, uh, that's something that I, I think is important um, uh, because after all, Troy is the Luvian homeworld, the homeland, right? <laughs> that's, that's considered home. And, um, and we do have, Luvian poetry that's emer emerging and again, Luvian mythology, it's a big deal. What they're doing now, because they don't have a lot of time, is they're doing soundings of these various sites. And then they're doing exploratory digging. Uh, and sometimes they'll, do, they'll, they'll, do, they'll, they'll explore, they'll do this tunnel. But they know they're, they're doing the context, so they're not messing up with material culture. They tunnel down, and they're bringing back uh, literal documents. Yeah, so a lot of these places were covered over. Uh, there's lots of wars going on, so this means that um, places get destroyed, and documents get covered over. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and remember, if they are using, if they are happen to be using uh, anything that's out of clay. If there's a fire, it only makes it stronger. If, if, you know, if you cook it, you're, you know, so that's a good thing. If there's a fire, so you're, but they do write on paper too. So, or I should say parchment, but um, they all use different kinds of methods. But yeah, um, I'll, I'll go a little bit further. They discovered yet another kingdom for the first time last year that we'd never heard of before. Another wow. Turkey. They just discovered it, and uh, and over the name of the king. They just figured out his territory. And now they're trying to figure out, and they have a little bit of the mythology. And he's, they're Luvian, because remember, all these Luvians are independent states. I know, I know it's easier for us to think of the Hittites, you know, because they're, they're unified. You know, sort of. But uh, the reality is, is in a lot of these places, it's independent uh, states centered around cities uh, that was predominant. Uh, in the southern as well as western Anatolia, and at the same time as we know in Greece, right? City states, right? You know, Corinth and, and Athens and Thessaly and Sparta, and, right? Is it right? So it's the same thing again. So we have to kind of change our mindset, but there's still they're all Greeks. The same thing goes with the southern and western coast of, of Asia Minor, still all Nubians. You know, they're all Nubians. And um, they, they have similar uh, customs and culture uh, and um, foods and produce and trade networks. And they kind of work together, just like the ancient Greeks. Fascinating. Ooh. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Any other questions? Actually, I had a question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I'm in uh, Northern Canada, uh -huh. I'm a little isolated. I do have the book 1177, which was really good to read, but would you have any suggestion for some reading that takes in some of these modern finds? Oh, wow. You know, again, so much uh, is, is not, it, it's not, uh, it's in journals. It's in, it's, it, it's not in, I wish I'm looking up right now. Um, Maybe we can give it like a journal or something. Um, I wish that it was more published. Um, let's see here. All right. Um, what did you think of 1177? I did not read it. Yeah, I know. Me bad, right? <laughs> No, I didn't read it. Okay, so I'm finding great pictures, but I'm not, not seeing. Um, I'm seeing the. Uh, you can't even see these. But these are the, the, the sky. Looking at from the sky, there's, there's some of the uh, Luvian cities that they're seeing. 
from, from above, but uh, they don't really show up very well. Of course, you know, these artificial hills. Full is, that a, is that a mound? Yeah. Like a, like a, wow, okay, interesting. They're all over the place. Yeah, wow. there's, there's these mounds of Luvian sites all over Western uh, Anatolia that are just begging to be excavated. And I, I wish. I was know, 20 I, years younger, maybe, maybe that would be the, uh, the well, path. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, or, or, or maybe just getting more people involved. I think, I think awareness uh, is is half the battle. By the way, I'm, I am looking for something that I can give. So if you're wondering what I'm what I'm doing at the same time here, um, I was just actually wondering about ground penetrating radar. I have read that uh, they've been using it in Egypt and discovered a multitude of sites. Yes, they're, they're using them uh, right now in Anatolia with amazing results. Yeah, amazing results and. Um, all right, see, so, oh, I think we'll find it right here. They just found a city in Egypt today. Yeah, they're finding them all the time. Okay, where is it? Sorry, I'm trying to find something that would, that would, okay, I got it. So I have a way for you to get information. And um, so what I want you to do, uh, it's on YouTube, but um, you, you'll be able to get everything you need through this. Uh, it's the site is called Luvian Studies, L U W I A N Studies, and here you're going to find um, the, the president of Luvian Studies. His name is Z A N G G E R, Eberhard Ziegner. 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 Um, Ziegner. Oops. And it turned out to be a whole civilization. And the civilization needed a name, and I decided to call it the Luvian civilization. And the talk today will be about this civilization. Um, it existed, it thrived. There we go. So there's a guy. So the guy that uh, had, is doing all the work, he's still alive. And under Luvian studies, you could hear his work. How's that? That, that sounds it, great. Is so that, is that the best? Is that, when I was in, when I was in university studying history, if I had gone to my professors with a YouTube video, I think they would have shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but in this case, uh, he is the world expert on Luvian studies, and um, he will give you the person who is top dog uh, in the field will give you everything that you need to know, as well as sources and. It's all there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. He will he will also show you videos of the sites and will and show you some of these uh, discoveries. Yeah, so so uh, so you know, I know we can read the articles or you can you can listen to those who write the articles. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of his articles are in German. <laughs> and so much of the scholarship is in German. Uh, I did a talk. Uh, connected to Artemis of Perge, which is a Luvian goddess uh, here at uh, Ipso Facto. And I did the research and it was so hard because I'd say about 80% of the materials that I had to go through and read, it took me over a month to get through it. It wasn't German. I had to read all the German because they're not publishing in English. And that's another, another thing I want to bring up is Luvian studies are not published enough in the English speaking world. Uh, it's mostly uh, Germans uh, and Austrians, and uh, it's not it's not fair. So they're being filled in, while while we have this. I, I love one of his jokes is pretty funny. Uh, he shows a map of Anatolia, and the whole thing is the Hittites, right? And he's and he, and he says he says yeah, the Hittites would like that to be the case. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't. They were really just a small little area in the central uh, plateau region, and everything around it are Luvians. But they would want you to think they had the whole thing. <laughs> it shows that their rhetoric worked. But the reality is, the Hittites never fully secured the southern, uh, the western, or even uh, the 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 uh, the north uh, western coast of Asia Minor. They never. 
they have it at times and then they lose it. It, it was always Luvians. And they didn't like that either. The Hittites uh, thought of themselves as superior. Uh, but um, And here are these Luvians who they looked at as below them uh, had all the best resources, best areas. I mean, take a look at Western Anatolia. It has all the rivers. It has the best arable land. It has all the rich mineral resources. I mean, it's like having California, right? And then, you know, the, the Hittites are kind of like, in, well, you know, further further east. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to upset our listeners in Arizona or New Mexico, but you know what I'm saying? It's a little bit drier, more arid. If that makes any sense. And so there you have it. Um, the Luvians had the best land. And um, because of that, they fought a lot. And a lot of people wanted that area in between. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much, Jack. Yeah. So any other any other thoughts? No problem. It's a cool looking website. I found it really quick while you were talking about it. Is, isn't it great? Yeah. 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 I'll spend some tomorrow time on that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. And um, um, if you can, uh, there are there are there are sources that are, are, are to be found there. So on the website, as well as of course the YouTube channels, it's great to listen to. So spreading the good news of the Luvians. You know, something that maybe many of you never heard the word before, and now it's all of a sudden to be this, you know, the Luvians. <laughs> like, what? Wow, what are you talking about? <laughs> yes. Um, oh, yes. I have another lecture uh, in two weeks on Poseidon. And uh, I'll tell you a little secret. We're going to go a little deeper on that one, too. So we'll be talking about the Minoans and the Mycenaeans in connection to Poseidon. So... So that's something that uh, if you're interested in this, you'll be interested in other talk. So I'll be there. I, that was fascinating about the origin of Zeus and Poseidon that you had mentioned earlier. I had no idea. So I look forward to learning more about that. Yes, a fem no, and I intentionally kind of move fast through it. <laughs> but yes, a feminine version of Poseidon. What, what is that? Dr. Riefeld, stop, stop. Wait, how many servants is this? this, this is, is a temple dedicated to the feminine Poseidon and a feminine Zeus? Wait, what? Where, where? In, in, in linear B documents? You know, yeah, so we'll, we'll go there. We'll go into offerings and we'll go into who Poseidon was viewed at by from the Minoans and, the, and then we'll go into the Mycenaeans and then we'll move into the, uh, the archaic and the um, classical Greek period. All right. Well, I think we're we're okay. If there's no more questions, I think I shall call it a night. Thank you. So, I could actually ask you questions all night, but <laughs> well, Thank well, you it's so much. wonderful having you all here, and I look forward to great job. Thank you. Thank you so. Thank you so much, Thomas, for being here, and 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 uh, Vern and uh, Jack and Bridget and Laurel and. On and did I get everybody and Jim and Margie and Terry? Yo, I got everybody there. Okay, uh, thank you, and I'll see you in uh, two weeks. Yep. Thank you. Good, good night, everyone. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.